over the long term, why would you want listed real estate in an investment portfolio? I think real estate is an interesting asset class in the sense that it lies somewhere between fixed income and equities, almost a bit of a hybrid. Now, one of the most attractive things about real estate is that you have these long-term stable income streams through the form of, of lease agreements, um, which generally grow at inflationary plus levels, which makes it a very attractive uh, investment um, proposition. I think what's also attractive about it is that when you invest in real estate, there's an actual underlying value to the tangible asset that you're investing in, which you could realize upon a liquidation scenario or any other event. I think that contrasts quite um, significantly when you think of something like tech stocks, for example, where there's a lot of value in the company, but if things were to go belly up, what is the tangible value that remains? It's, it's, it's very hard to, to, to put a, a number on that. I think on the listed side, it gets even more attractive in the sense that, you know, one of the biggest challenges with, with direct real estate is the illiquidity. So for example, anybody who's bought or sold property will know it can take months, sometimes even years to be able to sell a property at the right price. You know, you've got to find a buyer, you agree on a price, it can be a very lengthy process. And what we find is that when people, you know, an event happens in their life, they need liquidity, they need to realize some money, if that money is tied up in physical property, it can be very hard to realize. Case in point, we look now towards the UK, where you know, a lot of your, your readers may be familiar with, a lot of the physical direct real estate funds in the UK at the moment have actually gated their funds on the back of the COVID crisis. You look back to 2016 with the Brexit referendum, the same thing happened. So what happens, a big event happens, people want liquidity, they want to be able to draw down on those investments, but those funds cannot actually honor those redemptions because they don't have the amount of cash to, to honor the redemptions unless they start to sell down the underlying real estate. The problem is you don't want to be selling that real estate in a, in a crisis scenario. You're probably not going to get the price that you want, or you might not even be able to sell it. So that creates big liquidity problems in the direct market. Turn over to the listed market. You can sell your, your listed property stocks at the click of a button, literally. You look at a fund like ours, we are able to liquidate our entire portfolio within five days. Okay, so within one day, we can liquidate 85% of our portfolio, within two days, 95%, and within five days, the whole portfolio can be sold down to zero. And that's under very conservative market environment where we wouldn't want to be more than 20% of the market volume in a particular stock on any given day so that we don't tank the price. If we were to, to disregard that and go to a higher percentage of market volume, we could easily liquidate the portfolio in one day. And we think that's really a key advantage of listed real estate in that you get to realize whatever value you want very quickly. I think another benefit to, to listed real estate are just the lower transaction costs. Again, anybody who's bought a, a home or an apartment or, or any form of physical property will know that the transaction costs on that are enormous bond registration costs, conveyancing fees, you know, the list goes on and on. Again, you can transact in listed real estate uh, at, at literally a, a couple of, of basis points. So it's much, much cheaper. I think sort of the last benefit I touched on would just be the diversity of the opportunity set within listed real estate. And here I'm talking particularly within the global listed real estate environment. If you look at our global listed real estate fund, we are able to invest in developed markets across the world. So US, Canada, UK, Europe, developed Asia and Australia. That's our investable universe. And then within that, we have multiple different sectors within which we can invest. You know, when people think of real estate, even listed real estate, they often think shopping malls, office blocks and industrial, and that's it. If you look at our global universe, we have a, a broad range of sectors that we can invest in. Some are incredibly specialized. You find something like data centers. Data centers are basically big warehouses that house data storage and processing devices. Okay. If we take a step back, the, due to the amount of data that has been consumed, transferred, and stored, there's an ever increasing need for these data centers. So we see very strong demand behind this relatively new uh, REIT sector. Furthermore, what we also see is that large companies who previously 
housed their own data storage in-house. So if you think a bank or a large institution would have stored their own data, what we actually see now is the economies of scale are tilting towards these third-party Greek providers. You can actually provide the storage at a much cheaper and more efficient rate than companies can do it themselves. So you start to find the big corporates are outsourcing this to third-party REITs. So therefore, we see within the real estate space that data centers is a sector which has very strong multi-year tailwinds behind the demand. Okay. So another subsector which we are, are, are very positive on within the, real, within the residential real estate space is a sector called single family rentals. So that's basically a sector that was born out of the global financial crisis. What happened in, in 2008 is a lot of individual homes. So that's homes like you or I might own out in the suburbs, standalone homes as opposed to apartments and apartment blocks. It's, it's a standalone homes. And many of these standalone homes were repossessed you know, post GFC. The banks ended up with all these homes on their balance sheet, which they didn't want. So a lot of private equity firms and hedge funds came in, bought out these homes from, from the bank, at pennies on the dollar and sort of putting them together and compiling these portfolios of single family homes. What happened after that was as they aggregated that eventually some of them were, were listed and spun out into, into the public market and we now sit with you know, two particular listed uh, REITs which focus only on single family rentals which again are standalone homes out in the suburbs. What's interesting about this is you know firstly the economies of scale which these REITs realize. I mean, Invitation Homes, for example, owns 82,000 standalone homes. So their ability to manage these, repair them, do refurbishments, is just so much more efficient than, for example, you or I going and trying to do work on our one or two apartments that we might own. That's the first benefit. Second benefit is, you know, we're talking about multi-billion dollar REITs here. They've got access to capital that the individuals such as you or I just don't have. They can go and borrow money from banks. They can issue more. They can issue bonds. They can raise uh, equity in the equity markets at much lower rates than the individual can do. So that again gives them, you know, an incredible cost of capital advantage when going out to market to bid for these assets. But what's even more exciting about about the sector than those two factors are actually the the demographics which are behind the sector. So. We now find ourselves at a point in time where your millennials, your, your millennial cohort, sort of at the age of about 33 is the, is the biggest millennial cohort at the moment. And that is generally the age where individuals move from, uh, from living in an apartment to moving into these standalone single family homes. They're generally getting married, they're having kids, they need more space. What would have traditionally happened with prior generations is that you know, these individuals would taken out a mortgage and, and gone and bought their own home. What we see at the moment with the current generation is that firstly, millennials don't want that long-term commitment. So the idea of a, mill a millennial going and taking out a 20-year mortgage is actually quite daunting and unattractive and unappealing to them. So what we find is that millennials are actually wanting to rather rent these homes as opposed to buy them. Second factor that's driving it is that since the global financial crisis, banks have become a lot tighter on their lending standards and their lending criteria to issue these mortgage bonds. So we find that a lot of these people who may have wanted to buy are actually not able to buy. You add that, you sort of add to the fact that many of these millennials are, are starting off in life with enormous amount of student debt. A lot of them are just not able to, to access um, the debt markets to buy homes. What that all means is that more and more of this age group are actually forced into renting their standalone homes, or single family homes, which is obviously normal, an enormous tailwind for companies like Invitation Homes in the sector. So I, I think that the point that I'd make is that you know, the attractiveness of, of listed real estate is, is really quite enormous. Just the opportunity set that's available there across the world, across different sectors, across different stocks within those sectors, you know, the ease with which you can transact, buy or sell, um, is just really uh, second to none.